So we're managing large-scale cloud infrastructure at Rackspace. Uh, I am Jesse Keating. Uh, I've been doing cloud-type stuff uh, since 2002 when I joined Rackspace. I went from zero cloud experience to being put in a very critical position of one of the largest public clouds out there. So that was awesome. Um, before that, I was a Fedora release engineer at Red Hat from 2005 to 2012. I did many fine Fedora Linux releases um, and then some Anaconda work along with that. Uh, currently, an OpenStack engineer at Blue Box, a fun little startup here in Seattle, just down the road at the entrance of Pike Place Market. And if you want to reach out to me, the best place to find me is on Twitter uh, at I am Jay Keating. So let's talk about the Rackspace public cloud. It is powered by OpenStack, OpenStack being the open source Python cloud platform software that is totally awesome. The Rackspace public cloud has six production regions, many, many small pre-production regions. And for those of you unfamiliar with what OpenStack looks like, OpenStack in its simplest form is a collection of software that provides compute, networking, and storage resources behind a, uh, an API service. So it utilizes standard hardware, provides an API to your end users, you get to create computers with networking and storage as you wish. In reality, it's a little bit more complex. There's some underlying services going on. We've got Nova for our compute resources. We've got Glance for storage of images or fetching of images. Swift is where some of the images happen to live. Uh, Sender is, uh, is block storage that you might attach to your compute. There's Neutron for networks. Um, Solometer for monitoring. Keystone for authorization. These all things sort of talk to each other. So this is a little bit more of a realistic view of what goes on. Not all of these components are in use at the Rackspace Public Cloud, but this is a standard look at what an OpenStack implementation might look like. When you get right down to it, though, this is a little bit more like what's going on. Now, this is just Nova, right? This is just what's happening to create a uh, virtual machine on a particular hypervisor. Nova has to talk to a number of other things, so it looks a little bit more like this. And I can't even show all of it on the screen because it's just so big. Um, and once you make it big enough to see, it is very hard to read. But essentially, each of these are bits and pieces of software that has to run somewhere. And in the Rackspace Public Cloud, each and every one of these little circles is a particular piece of service that is running on a particular machine. Now, the Rackspace public cloud runs all of those control pieces of infrastructure on an internal private cloud. Yes, it's a bit like yo dog, but if, it, if that breaks your mind, just deal with it. So how do we manage building such a big complex thing at Rackspace? So over the years, we have created our own nice snarl of things that happen that is how we manage the flow of code that's coming in from the upstream public production of OpenStack down through our internal resources and out into our public cloud. So let's walk through what's going on here a little bit. All of the code for OpenStack starts off in the public upstream repositories. It is managed through uh, Garrett and GitHub and it's all done out in the public uh, as part of the OpenStack Foundation. We, or I should say we did, they, uh, Rackspace, would pull that code from the upstream repositories down into Rackspace's internal GitHub instance. That would be manipulated with patch management system. There's, there's Jenkins in use as a scheduling thing that happens to pull the content at a timely basis. And there's some in-house custom software that was written to integrate localized changes. Uh, some of that is actually public called Ply, and I wish I could give you the URL, but I didn't add it in. But Ply is a way of taking a repository pull full of patch files and integrating them into a source tree and creating an ephemeral 
branch that is the result of the downstream patches applied on top of the upstream code. It's ephemeral as in it is created and then left there alone. Um, it is not a continual development stream. Every time new code is pulled from upstream, a new ephemeral branch is created with those patches applied to it, if they apply cleanly. In order to get patches into the code, there is change gating that happens. This is also something that happens downstream in Rackspace's uh, infrastructure. All the code that's going upstream is going through a very rigorous CI process in order to make sure that that code is as functional and as good as we can test it to be. We wanted the same type of rigor to be applied to the code that was being produced downstream, and so a large number of of tests were created to functionally test that code before it ever got into the patch repository. Once the change was tested well, it also gets pulled into the enterprise GitHub instance. Configuration management is added into the mix. Rackspace is using a mixture of Ansible and Puppet to manage the configuration on the individual instances that we saw on that previous screen. This content is also goes through change gating and also goes into the GitHub. Once all of those things are there, we go into the packaging phase where the content is pulled out of GitHub and some custom internal software is written or is used to turn all of that content into a pile of Python virtual environments for all of the OpenStack code plus a repository for either the Puppet or the Ansible code. And that's all wrapped up into a tarball and put onto a payload server. And finally, we get to the deploy orchestration, which is uh, Ansible driven by Jenkins that will take that content and make it live in the production regions. Before we get into what a deployment looks like, let's talk a little bit about the pipeline for how things get done. There is a pipeline, it may be hard to read. Yep, it's very hard to read, let's zoom in a little bit. It's a little easier. So first we have OpenStack continuous integration. This is what's happening upstream as changes are thrown at the various projects that exist for OpenStack. Every change that comes in will result in a series of tests that will actually build a cloud, run some functional tests against that cloud, and report the results back. There are also hooks for third-party tests to respond to that change, clone that code down, run their own testing set, and report back whether it was good or, or bad. So lots and lots of tests happen. Uh, this is a very, very interesting piece of technology. If you ever get a chance to dig into it, it is one of the most comprehensive and well-performing CI environments I've ever come across. So OpenStack continuous integration happens. That's a big upstream bubble. And the smaller bubble next to it is where Rackspace merges in the localized patches and the packaging of those localized patches happens. We then take that content and put it into Rackspace continuous integration. The Rackspace continuous integration involves taking a pile of capacity hypervisors and a selection of internal cloud instances and building from scratch a new OpenStack cloud. We call this the, de the deploy to CI. It starts with rebuilding all of the existing instances for the control plane. It continues on to flush all the things off of the hypervisors and standing up as if it were a brand new cloud and running through a bunch of automated testing. This happens every single night and sometimes multiple times a day if a user decides to, or a developer decides that something else needs to get pulled in. Eventually, something, either a timer or a particular feature or what have you will trigger the need to choose a new release branch. So those ephemeral branches that we talked about, that's what becomes the release branch, and that's where all further changes for this particular code will go into. We take that release branch, and we take that package that was built from that ephemeral branch, and we promote it into our next step, which is deploying to the test environment, which is a continual environment. We don't have to rebuild that one, just straight up deploy, and start doing the automated testing on that as well. So it's the same artifact, the same artifact that was built for 
the continuous integration environment is the same artifact that gets deployed into the next test environment. Once we're in the test environment and we're looking forward to picking a full production release candidate, we go through a series of steps. Our, our pre-production environment is a bit more shared with some of the other cloud resources and some of the other things that Rackspace does around the public cloud. So we don't quite have as much freedom to destroy it or ruin it uh, as will or at will. So we do scheduled maintenances into the pre-production environment. Uh, we schedule a certain time that we can make changes and we make everybody aware that there's going to be a change and may be unstable. Please hold on to your butts. We do the deployment into the pre-prod, same exact artifact again, just a new target. Run through automated testing, run through manual testing, go through a bunch of meetings for go, no-go decisions. Is this right? Is this good? Does this make sense? We then decide that a particular branch uh, or the, the branch at that particular point is good for release and we tag it that way. The packaging happens if we've made any changes. Um, and if we find any problems along the way, as indicated by some of the bubbles, we just throw that change into the branch, make a new set of packages, do that deployment again, repeat, 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 until eventually you have something that's good. And once a release candidate is picked and we're ready to go into production, we move on to the next stage. <clears throat> the, product, the production delivery stage. Again, the, there are scheduled maintenances because these are live environments that have lots and lots and lots of customers, something like tens of thousands of customers in our production regions. We don't want to have unannounced interruptions there. So scheduled maintenance, uh, deploy that artifact into production. Again, the same exact artifact, just a different target. We run through validation tests after the deployment and we consider that particular deployment done. So when do we do this, or when was this done? This is a, a rough idea. Weekly, we might have point releases that go out. These are small changes made to a major pull from upstream. Something that we needed to fix is a bug fix or a small feature flag enablement. Uh, we can do a minor change, build out a new package, validate it, get it out into production. We can do that um, at about the pace of once a week. We attempt on a monthly basis to do no, new pulls of code from upstream. That's going to be what we call major, major releases. Those are a little bit more difficult to consume, a little bit more testing needs to happen on that, a little more rigor, and that happens about monthly. And that allows Rackspace to follow, to closely follow Trunk to pick up all the new stuff that's happening. The main goal that we're set forth is that we want process for getting bug fixes and new features into the Rackspace public cloud to flow through upstream as the quickest way. That way all of the development happens in the upstream world where there is that rigor and that CI and we aren't creating a pile of technical debt that we have to carry forward in that next major pull. So it's the release early release often model applied to deploy early deploy often at the scale of the public cloud. So let's talk a little bit about deployments at Rackspace. We called the deployments the Kraken, and so we like to release the Kraken often. So a deployment, we attempt to utilize the, to, to utilize the ec economy of scale of the public cloud. Um, each region is upwards to seven or 8,000 hypervisors with a big pile of control units on top of that. Uh, I believe that the grand total of things that need to be touched are in the 40,000 units land, somewhere in that area. So there's a lot of things that we have to touch. Uh, it makes sense to try and do that in the most efficient way possible. So the first thing that we do is we have the ability to pre-stage the content and external facts that would drive that content well ahead of our scheduled maintenance. The package is that tarball that was created that has all the virtual environments in it. We want 
a single thing that goes out everywhere that allows us to be very efficient in how we do it, use torrent. So torrent will take that tarball, put it on all the systems, extract it into a new path, and it just sits there waiting. We use external facts to drive our Puppet and Ansible content, and so we ship those out and to a new staging path as well onto all the systems. All of this can happen well ahead of the outage. If we pre-stage content that doesn't actually go live, no big deal, we just throw another set out there. And when it comes time to do the deployment during the outage window, an, a sim link on the file system is updated. That takes us from version one to version two. Simplify the numbers there a little bit. And then we start rolling through the services. <clears throat> In previous iterations of our deployment process, uh, we were not quite so smart in how we did things, and instead we just stopped all the services and then started all the services and let the whole thing sort itself out. But at the scale that we are working at, that was creating longer API outages than was desired, and it meant that we couldn't upgrade at the pace that we wanted to upgrade because our customers wouldn't allow that instability to happen so often. So we got smarter and we started doing things in more logical groups. Within the control plane of OpenStack, there are certain things that you can take down at will, things that read content off of message buses rather than being contacted directly over an API. So that's the, the first, yeah, it's the first thing that we shut down. We shut down those processes and then we run local configuration on those systems to bring those processes back up along with any changes that config manage might, might want to put in place. Once those services are, are brought back up, we'll then go after the API services, the ones that have direct content contact to them, and we go through them in a little bit more ordered, or at least in a smaller set to allow our load balancers to take advantage of learning that something is no longer responding and routing traffic to something else. So we'll roll through those one at a time, taking them down, applying configuration which brings them back up, take the next one down, apply configuration, bring them back up. Once all of the control plane is done, we will then move on to our uh, compute processes. Computes are the big, hairy mess of systems, the, the vast majority of things that we touch. There might be 100 control units for 6,000 computes, <clears throat> so it makes sense to do those last. In the compute side, any outage of a compute only affects the particular virtual machines that are running on that particular hypervisor, so we can go through them in a smaller batch. About 200 or so at a time, we send them a graceful shutdown uh, sig signal, which allows them to finish processing anything they might have without taking on anything new, and eventually they will all stop or hit a timeout where they'll be less gracefully shut down. And then we bring them that set back up and roll through all the capacity, like I said, 200 at a time. And that will complete our deployment. While this upgrade is happening, instances that are running do not stop running. They continue to run, they continue to respond to the network, they continue to do the work that the customer has them doing. The only thing that gets affected is the API for OpenStack that the clients may be wanting to use to manipulate those resources. But by rolling through the logical groups and rolling through API units one at a time, we're able to very minimally impact the API. All of this is driven by Ansible. Ansible is our orchestration of choice. It gives us the freedom to order our actions in a very clear and logical way, then allows us to roll batch sizes very easily and just works very well for us. So some of the reasons why we chose the tools. <clears throat> At Rackspace, open source was very, very important. OpenStack itself was, was open source. It was a very early decision made by Rackspace and by NASA in creating the OpenStack uh, piece of software and then later gifting it to a foundation. The tools that we chose needed to be able to scale. As we said, we had at times 40,000 things to touch. We wanted to do those in an efficient manner. 
Uh, another reason why open source is preferred is that while there are lots and lots of really cool things out there, lots of startups around cool pieces of software to manage scale or manage infrastructure, the cost of those starts to get really high when you multiply them by 40,000. And so it was important that we find tools that we could use that didn't cost us you know, multiple years of salary. We also preferred that there be a vibrant community around the particular piece of software. While it's fun to be the only one using something and finding all the hairy corners, it's also, not, it's also fun to have other people using it as well and have other minds that can be applied to fixing the problems that you might come across. So the tool set that we use is Ansible. Again, it's very, very vibrant, it's open source. While we were one of the largest users for a while, we aren't anymore. Uh, so there are other large users of Ansible that are helping define those rough edges when you start scaling it out. Jenkins is used. Um, there's a big community around it, open source, free. It does our jobs very, very well. Uh, Jenkins is also used by the OpenStack upsource, or uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the OpenStack upstream for a lot of their usage. And there's a nice bit of tooling built around Jenkins for manipulating the configuration without having to go through mouse buttons as well, which is really, really important for us. Again, Puppet was in use for on-machine configuration of software in a Puppet masterless way. Redmine for our issue tracking and for our uh, Kanban-like work, creating stories, epics, tasks, moving them from one thing to the other. And anything that didn't already exist out there that we had to create, Python was our tool of choice. So the future, uh, things that will happen Zero downtime deployments is very, very important to the OpenStack community. While what I described was kind of the best case scenario, while there were no database migrations involved, uh, sometimes when we do upgrades to new pieces of OpenStack code, there are database migrations in which we do need to bring all the services down. Upstream and the operator community at large are working together to try and find ways to do our upgrades of OpenStack including database migrations in a way that doesn't take our services down. That work, it, a lot of that work was done for the last OpenStack release and a lot of that work will continue in the next OpenStack release. Having no downtime deployments also means that you can do more frequent deployments. Uh, getting down to the point where you're doing micro deployments of a few changes is really, really empowering as an operator for when you see a change in behavior, you can pinpoint it to a very small set of things that changed. Git bisecting, say, 20 changes is a whole heck of a lot easier than Git bisecting 2,000 changes. There's also a move to microservice independence. If we looked at that big screen of all the things that are involved in OpenStack, a lot of the Rackspace deployments treated that entire blob as a single artifact. Everything moved forward at the pace of everything else. But in reality, in the way the upstream works, a lot of those services are independent. They move at their own pace. They have their own cycle. Uh, and only at the major releases do they all sync up for any sort of concerted release effort. Rackspace doesn't consume major releases. They consume trunk. And so it makes more sense to treat each of those services within Rackspace as its own individual product with a public API contract that all the other services utilize. And so the work has begun to start taking some of those services and breaking them apart from the big massive thing and creating its own independent artifact with its own independent configuration that can be deployed and upgraded at its own independent pace. A couple of uh, required slides here. Um, turns out there's an opening at Rackspace. Uh, if you're interested, <laughs> if you are interested, here's a couple of, of contacts. If you can't read this, come find me after and I'll get you that information. 
you want to help in some of the fun stuff that's going on, if you like working at very, very big scale, Rackspace is a really awesome place to go for that. And Blue Box is also hiring, if you happen to like Seattle or other places. Uh, there, oops, there's a URL. Again, come find me after if you want to write that down. It's kind of long. Um, what we're specifically hiring for, um, Ruby on Rails, OpenStack Engineering, Linux System Administration, Account Executive. Um, it's a fun place to work. And that's it. With that, I want to open it up to questions and discussions and go. Hi, uh, Paul Krizak, uh, Qualcomm. Uh, I'm curious how you're um, specifically, what you're doing with Ansible as far as the orchestration part. Um, could you maybe go into a little more detail about what um, what Ansible is doing for you that maybe some shops that may not be using it, maybe doing a bunch of scripts? <laughs> sure. So when I joined Rackspace, um, they were doing deployments with a bunch of scripts. It was uh, some bash scripts written around PSSH in order to target a large set of systems at once or sort of at once and do a set of operations on them. Some of that operations would be, like I said, downloading the new content, extracting it, updating a sim link, running Puppet locally on the system in order to get configuration in. Um, but it wasn't so awesome. Um, PSSH is great for just sending a command everywhere, but then you have to scrape the screen to figure out which ones failed. Uh, anything that wasn't responsive is going to be hit over and over and over again for a series of tasks, and you're going to hit timeouts and timeouts and timeouts. Um, and it just wasn't very friendly to all of our developers to try and manipulate this bash script or this set of wiki pages that were cut and paste into terminals in order to do these deployments. So what Ansible brought to the table is a very clean file format, YAML, for expressing the tasks that need to happen for a deployment or for any sort of orchestration action. Because it's written, because it's ordered, it's very easy for anybody to open up a YAML file and understand this is the first task that every host will get, this is the second task, this is the third task, and just follow it step by step by step. Um, Ansible does things is in highly parallel fashion. We're able to, with a not very powerful system, give it 500 forks to operate on 500 machines at once, and it keeps those forks busy. As soon as one finishes, uh, it'll pull in the next of the waiting pool in order to operate. And it's also smart about detecting failures. If it encounters one system it cannot connect to, it will stop attempting to connect to it for future tasks. And so we don't have to pay the penalty of a down system over and over and over again. And when you deal at the scale that we were dealing, we always had down systems, right? There's always something that's just not responding. So it was, it allowed us to very easily express how the, the operations that we wanted to do, uh, it made it very easy to execute them and to, to have the reporting at the end of which ones are successful, which ones are fail failures. Uh, it allowed us to express uh, idipotence or idempotence in our actions so that if we did have a failure partway through, we can retry again with either the full set or a limited set of hosts. And any action that had already been done would, would, would be a fast return. Uh, and it was um, very approachable for our developers and for our uh, junior engineers to get their hands dirty with changing how those things happened. So it started off with replacing like I said, some bash scripts, start off by replacing uh, some fabric files that weren't very approachable and were half done. And it really grew from there. Uh, as the knowledge spread within the teams, we got more, or I got more and more and more contribution into our Ansible playbooks to the point where when we started creating the microservice split outs, the developers explicitly asked, don't do this again in Puppet, let's do it all the way in Ansible so that we can continue the, the awesome things that we're able to do in the on-system configuration. Long answer, but that's, that's it. 
Hey, Jesse, thanks for coming. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that really interests me is the, uh, I guess, providing resiliency of a lot of the base programs in OpenStack. Can you talk a little about how you guys are deploying it and more specifically providing resiliency across regions and the whatnot for you know, all the, the core components? So that's a good question. Um, the way that the Rackspace public cloud works, they're, they're, for some of the OpenStack services, like the block storage or the object storage, there is definitely resiliency across the regions where the data is replicated across multiple regions. And that's just a function of the backend storage system that's at play. Um, some smart networking engineers have figured out ways of securely connecting multiple data centers and, and efficient ways of getting that content to travel across those. Uh, and then there are ways that load balancers are working and service registries are working so that if one region's API endpoints are down, that work can be picked up by another region's endpoints. For things like compute resources, that's not quite as good of a story. With compute, you are able to be somewhat resilient within a region. You might have multiple uh, physical locations within that region, different parts of the data center, and you'll be able to migrate workloads from, from one part of that data center to another part of that data center. But there, was, there were no migrations from one data center all the way to another. So if the compute API endpoint for one data center went down, then all the resources behind that API were also down for that, for that uh, environment. Um, so that's, that's, again, a, a little bit of a limitation in how OpenStack itself works, and a bit of a limitation in how Rackspace implemented OpenStack and how they implemented their regions. Uh, and I think that's pretty common with, with a lot of the public cloud providers, that you get some resiliency within an environment for, for some of those, those more particular services, while other services you'll have resiliency across regions. Any further questions? We're, we've got plenty of time, so if there's anything, anything at all, throw it at me. All right, well, thank you.